Hello and welcome to this tutorial on activating behavior change. This tutorial is adapted from the third part of chapter 5 in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. You can find other resources on the clinical applications of RFT at languageasintervention.com. In this tutorial, you will learn about increasing response flexibility. I'll start with summarizing the first two components we covered in the past two sections. First, we saw that to help clients make the changes they need to live a more satisfying life, we need to help them improve their awareness of their own actions and the contextual variables that influence these actions. We saw that this process can be broken down into three main skills, observation, description, and tracking. Then we saw that the pieces of the puzzle that were gathered by the awareness process need to be integrated into coherent symbolic networks that make sense and are useful. This is the process of functional sense-making, which includes normalization of psychological experiences and assessment of response effectiveness. Once clients have become more aware of their actions and of what influences these actions, and once they have a better sense of what response makes most sense in order to live a meaningful life, what we need is help them increase their response flexibility. It means that we need to help them increase their ability to respond in various ways to the context. If they can engage in various responses to the same situation, then they have greater freedom to take meaningful life directions even when something gets in the way, such as painful feelings or urges to do something else. So how can we help clients increase their response flexibility? If you remember our contextual behavioral framework, you know that to change a behavior, we need to alter the contextual sources of influence, either the antecedent or the consequence or both. And if we can't directly change these sources of influence, then we can alter the symbolic functions of these sources of influence. What we want is for the client to relate to sources of influence in a different way, which will open new ways of responding. To alter the way the client relates to sources of influence, we can follow two main approaches. One consists of changing the context around the source of influence, and the other consists of changing the context around the behavior. These two approaches are not mutually exclusive, but we will examine them one at a time. Let's see how they work more concretely. The first approach, changing the context around the source of influence, can be illustrated by this example. See this sentence on the board? Take a moment to notice your reactions to it. Then notice how you react to this. So we didn't touch the original sentence, but we changed the context around it. This way, we change its meaning and the impact it can have. If we do that, new responses to the original sentence can emerge. So in clinical practice, this approach can be applied through different means with language. It's impossible to make an exhaustive list of techniques because there are an infinite number, there's an infinite number of ways of altering the context with language. Let's explore a few examples. At the most basic level, without any additional framing, we can change the context by shifting posture or change our pace and tone of voice. Imagine, for example, a client who begins to talk about something very personal and has mentioned before how worried she is that she might be rejected when she talks about herself. Leaning forward, as she is sharing about her intimate life, could create a context around that fear that changes its impact. She is not rejected, but, but supported instead. Similarly, slowing down our speech could help a client respond to racing thoughts with less reactivity. Using coordination framing to make painful feelings compatible with meaningful action can help increase flexibility toward these painful feelings. A typical technique consists, for example, of reformulating statements such as I want to have greater intimacy, but I am afraid, as you want to have greater intimacy and you are afraid. Opposition framing is at the core of many techniques meant to create distance through irreverence, humor, or paradox. For example, a therapist could say to a client, hmm, that was really a great experience, huh? referring to fear experienced during exposure. The point is not to invalidate the experience, but to take it a bit more lightly, to see, uh, to see it as something less powerful. 
Opposition framing is also often useful to turn barriers into opportunities for meaningful actions. For example, when a client says, I'd really wish I could be more intimate in my relationship, but I'm afraid. The therapist could say, what if that fear was instead the sign that there is something imp important for you there? What if it was a cue that there is an opportunity to be intimate? Hierarchical framing can be used to reframe experiences as thoughts, feelings, emotions, or sensations. By doing so, the impact of an experience can change because it acquires the function of the category it belongs to. For example, a very fast heartbeat will generate different responses if it's interpreted as a sign of heart attack or excitement. Techniques included in self as context helps increase flexibility toward thoughts, feelings, and sensations because they are seen as the content of something bigger. This way, these experiences become less threatening and leave more space for responding in different ways. Analogies and metaphors can change the impact of a source of influence by bringing some useful functions from a different situation to the client's life. For example, encouraging a client to attribute formal properties to an emotion, like giving it a color, a shape, and size, can help create some distance because the emotion begins to be observed as something distinct from the self. If the source of influence is described through a metaphor that contains less painful functions, that source of influence can have a less powerful impact on the client's response too. For example, Talking about a sensation as an annoying neighbor could help the client notice her ability to tolerate some degree of pain, if that metaphor resonates with her, of course. A last example is a perspective taking through dialectic framing, which can help a client distance herself from a source of influence by putting it, by putting it a little farther. Since that distancing is metaphorical, visual cues can help make this process more effective. For example, a thought could be written on a board. Then the client could be invited to literally step back while looking at the written thought and notice the effect of that greater distance on his reaction to the thought. The second main approach, changing the context around the behavior, consists of inviting a client to do something different while the original source of influence remains the same. For example, a client could be invited to walk in cycle while repeating out loud I can't walk, I can't walk, I can't walk. Doing so will show that a response doesn't have to match the content of a thought. As a result, the thought would lose its impact on the response, and the response would become more flexible. So for this approach also, it's impossible to list all the ways we can use language to evoke a different response, while the original source of influence is untouched. So let's see some examples. At the most basic level, without any additional framing, we can, uh, for example, use reflective listening to evoke more talking about a topic that is usually avoided. For example, a client said, if a client said, it's uh, really scary to think about that, the therapist could reflect back, it's really scary to think about that, and then remain silent for a moment. Often, these kinds of reflections and silences are received as gentle encouragements to explore further a topic that otherwise would remain untouched. For example, the client might respond, yeah, it's scary because I wonder how I'm going to deal with this situation. So this response is already a sign of increased flexibility. Instead of avoiding the topic altogether, the client begins to explore it a little more. In a similar but a more explicit way, a therapist could block avoidance, which means make it less likely, by asking a question again when a client has changed the topic of conversation because it triggers painful emotions. The therapist could also set a context for curiosity, playfulness, or exploration. An exposure exercise could, for example, be framed as a journey in the jungle or a sport competition, depending on what resonates best with the client. The goal is to create a context that makes exploration of new responses more desirable. A therapist could also make a statement or ask a question to directly invite the client to try something new or different. For example, many experiential exercises contain instructions that invite clients to experiment a different approach to their feelings, thoughts, and sensations, like observing a sensation instead of trying to remove it, or trying to suppress a thought in order to notice that it's impossible in the long term. 
In a similar way, but slightly different, a therapist could invite a client to add another response to his current one. This already creates some variability, while there is less fear of changing the current response. For example, a client could be invited to say out loud, I'm afraid, or to raise her hand while still avoiding talking about a topic that triggers some fear. Here is a summary of the main points you've learned in this tutorial and that I encourage you to remember. In order to help clients actually uh, engage in more effective responses, we need to help them increase their response flexibility. To increase response flexibility, we need to alter the context of the client's response. This can be done through two main approaches. Changing the context around the source of influence, controlling the client's current response and changing the context around the client's behavior to evoke a new response. This is the end of this tutorial on increasing response flexibility. This tutorial was adapted from the third part of chapter 5 in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. If you want to watch the next tutorial on shaping behavior change, focused on reinforcing progress step by step, you can go to languageasintervention.com. You will also find other resources on the applications of RFT for clinical practice.